And we're on. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. I'm your host, Jacob Hansen, and I am joined by my good friend, Hayden Carroll. Hayden. Hey, good to be here. Good to have you, man. Well, we are continuing our conversation where we are reviewing uh, Jeff Durbin's, um, what essentially is his attack on me and my video critiquing him. So I made a video kind of responding to Jeff Durbin. Jeff responded to that, and now we're responding to that again. So it's one of those kind of things. Um, but uh, as we go into that, this this next video, he really hits on three main points. Again, I tried to boil down, like, what are the big points in this video? Because if you guys watch his video critique of me, which I'll link in the description, you will notice that it is, there's a, it's a, like an hour, you know, and a half long or whatever. But really it boils down to these three points as I see it. So I'm going to pull this up real quick. Um, so in this video, I talk about a guy named Michael Heiser. Heiser is a Christian biblical scholar, and um, he has some interesting views that we're going to get into here, uh, where he talks about the idea of there being multiple gods in the Old Testament. Um, and so Jeff Durbin's kind of three main contentions in this video is that Heiser, this guy that I'm talking about, is a Trinitarian. And because he's a Trinitarian, he doesn't agree with anything I have to say. And that's what he does. And then the other one is, is he says, you know, heavenly beings are not gods and theosis, you know, doesn't mean what I think it means. So we'll get into this. We'll, we'll go into these, but I wanted to kind of briefly give an outline of what we're going to be going over in this. But before we get to any of this, I actually wanted to, um, show what Michael Heiser said. So we're going to actually review this Christian scholar and what he says, because the Christian contention is that there's no other gods besides uh, our God. All other gods are imaginary. They're fake. They don't exist. And there's a question of if that is biblical, like, is that what the Bible actually teaches? Does the Bible teach that there are no other gods besides God. And Heiser gives some very interesting uh, commentary on that. So Hayden, anything else before we get into Heiser? No, let's, let's watch. I think it's good to review it so we can kind of see what we're dealing with before Jeff goes in. Cause, cause you'll notice again that Jeff doesn't give a lot of time to you to explain your position. So it's going to be good to actually watch what he's critiquing. Cause he doesn't really show it. I think towards the end, he maybe looks into a little bit, but at the beginning he kind of just goes off. So it'll be yeah. good to kind of understand what Heiser's saying first. So we're Perfect. all on the same page. Perfect. All right. So here goes Michael Heiser. Existence of deities other than the God of the Bible. While lesser spiritual entities such as angels and demons are real, figures from long dead religions like Zeus, Thor, and Ra, or the pantheons of modern religions like Hinduism, simply do not exist. They are imaginary. But as we will see, this view is too simplistic to capture what the Bible really communicates about the inhabitants of the divine realm. It may surprise many Christians to learn that God is often directly compared to other deities in Scripture. For you, Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? awesome in glory, working wonders. Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. These are only a handful of passages that praise Yahweh by showing his superiority to other gods. The question Christians must wrestle with is, how do statements like this make sense if these other gods do not really exist? Think of how it would sound if someone tried to exalt Jesus by comparing him to an imaginary creature. It would not only be offensive to say, Jesus is better than a leprechaun, it would be illogical. The same is true for the comparisons between God and other deities in the Old Testament. The ancient authors are not comparing God to imaginary beings. In order for these exaltations to be logical and non-blasphemous to ancient Israelites, the gods which Yahweh is compared to 
must be real. In Psalm 82, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, is said to hold judgment over other gods. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 82 becomes very interesting if you learn a little Hebrew. The word most often translated God or gods in the Old Testament is Elohim. Watch what happens when we reveal where that word is used in this passage. Notice that both the capital G, God, and the lowercase g, gods, were changed. That is because the word Elohim can be used for several different things. The context of the passage tells us what Elohim is referring to. The Bible's writers use Elohim as an alternate name for Yahweh over a thousand times, but Elohim can also refer to the gods of foreign nations, or demons, spirits of the human dead, and angels, most likely the angel of the Lord. As you can see, these are all inhabitants of the spiritual realm. It should be clear from this list that not all Elohim were considered equal. While Yahweh is an Elohim, the writers of the Bible considered him unique and far above the others. The ancient Israelites thought of the spiritual world as a three-tiered hierarchy with God at the top. It may surprise many Christians to learn that angels are actually on the lowest tier of the hierarchy. The Hebrew word for angel, malach, is basically a job description used to denote a spirit being who carries out modest tasks, like delivering messages. The tier above the angels is occupied by beings called Bene Elohim in Hebrew. Bene Elohim is usually translated sons of God in English Bibles. And when most people read that phrase, they are not even aware it refers to spiritual beings. But as we will see, the sons of God played an important role in the Old Testament. In the beginning of the book of Job, there is a meeting of God's court or council. Guess who is there? Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, a term that means adversary, also came among them. The sons of God do not only show up in God's throne room. Later in Job, we see that the sons of God were present at creation. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. We can see that the sons of God were important figures. In the Old Testament, they are often associated with God's inner circle. That inner circle has a name. Scholars call it the Divine Council, which comes from Psalm 82, verse 1. It is the collection of spiritual beings through which God chooses to administer his rule. All ancient Mediterranean religions had some concept of a divine council, and the Israelites were no different. And yet the Bible teaches plainly there is only... All right. So I wanted to start off with that as a preface to everyone who's watching. So you understand, I just showed what Michael Heiser says uh, in relation to this, uh, to, to uh, uh, there being, anyone who says that there's no other gods in the Bible, just they're disagreeing with Michael Heiser. He's, he's, he's pointing out that there clearly was an other conception of other figures uh, in the Bible. And, and I will say, and I, I, I tried to make this clear in the video as well, that those other figures weren't the most high God, right? They're like uh, Yahweh or, uh, or or God in the New Testament, there is a conception that the God of Israel is the most high. But the idea of there being a most high God 
seems to imply that there's others because that's why you're the most high. The most high of what? Mm -hmm. The most high yeah, of if, the other team. If there wasn't any others, you'd be the most high. You'd also be the most low. It's like <laughs> it, it requires point. more than one. So anyway, I, I, I anything else you want to say before we get no, into? No, no, uh, you, you, you go ahead and uh, and, and well, take the take the lead on this one. Well, let's just go to the first point. Um, I think it's at uh, time mark twenty four twenty one. Um, and would you guys just be weary of of a few things that listen to how much Jeff time listen to how much time Jeff gives Jacob to explain his point before drilling him on something that Jacob you don't believe and I'm gonna uh, we'll give you some time to kind of talk about that but just be aware of what's happening here Jeff is uh, at least when interacting with us anyway he's notorious for not understanding what we're saying uh, and then he goes off for about 30 minutes on each point about why we're wrong. And we're like, yeah, we agree with you, Jeff. Like that's not, we're, we're not in disagreement there. Like why, why are you not addressing the actual point? So let's watch it. And uh, let's see what Jeff says. You let's see what Jeff says. Your motive is, or your intention is. Okay. But all that to say, let's, let's lead in now to this uh, conversation. The title of the video, if you want to go watch it, is Jeff Durbin destroyed with facts and logic? Part two, the nature of God. And let's get right into it. So in this series, we are addressing the three main arguments of Jeff Durbin's video, The Gospel for Mormons. In the previous video, we took apart his view that an apostasy of the early church was not possible. And now we will examine his critiques about the Latter-day Saint notions about the nature of God. It really is about God. It really is about the gospel. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 10, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. In Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. God says in Isaiah 44, 8, Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other God. I know not one. Ah, the classic verses in Isaiah. Yes, Jeff, we're well aware of these verses. Unfortunately, Jeff shows his lack of understanding of ancient Hebrew idioms. I'm going to defer to... So quickly, um, th that's not a response to those verses. I want to point that out again. You did that last week in the episode we demonstrated your first video. Um, just waving the hand at the verses isn't an engagement with the verses. Uh, you have to substantiate the claim. Now, you're going to try to in a moment by abusing Heiser and you do abuse him, and you clearly don't understand Heiser, you're ignorant of this, this whole discussion itself, and you quote mind from Heiser, and you abused him. And like I said, it is a fact that if Heiser were alive today, I had communicated with him before, we weren't close friends, but I know he's Trinitarian, I know what the man believes, I've read his works, and you misrepresented him. Heiser, I would fly him out to be in studio with us to refute what you said he would tell you that you abused him. So we're going to see that in a moment here. But I just want to point out to you, Jacob, that that wasn't an engagement with those verses. Isaiah 43.10. You ready? Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. He clearly, God is clearly not talking about false gods there. Okay. Before me, there was no false God formed. Neither shall there be any false God formed after me. Uh, yeah, there were plenty of false gods formed after God. So he's not talking about false gods. Is he talking about what Heiser's talking about? Do you even know what Heiser's context was? Heavenly beings, supernatural beings that are of a different... Sp I just want to make a quick comment on this. Yeah. Because he's saying something, again, the verses that he's quoting in Isaiah, before me there was no God, nor will there be after me, th those kind of verses. The verses, when someone reads them at face value, it sounds like God is saying there is no other God in existence besides me. That's what Heiser refutes, see? So he now is, is altering the conversation where he's saying, well, of course there are false gods, but it's like, you didn't say that in your video, right? Like we don't, we don't declare that there are not other gods gods that are below god the father right but we we don't have this but but he's trying to twist it into he, he he's changing the subject in the video it's there are no other gods 
And that implies, he's implying that there exists no other gods. There's no such thing as another thing called a god except for the God of the Bible, the Hebrew God. And now he's saying, well, Heiser's right. There are other gods, but they're not the same as the, the true God, which is what he then goes on for about 15 minutes to, to refute. In essence, that's what he says. Okay, I'll, I'll continue here. Mm -hmm. Species then God? Is he talking about heavenly beings? Okay, ready? There was no heavenly being formed after me and no heavenly being formed, or sorry, before me and no heavenly being formed after me. Actually, that doesn't work either because there were heavenly beings formed after God. God created them. So when he says before me, there was no God formed and neither shall there be any God pause, formed so after me. Okay, so there's other presuppositions happening here. I was about to say the pre he presupposes some things here. Yeah, I mean he's 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 implying uh, presupposing uh, creation ex nihilo yep. that God created all things out of nothing, and he's assuming that you should be working under that framework. And if mm -hmm. that was true, you would be wrong, Jacob. But yeah. it, but he's he's, he's not going to say that. He's going to basically say it as if it is a fact, and that everybody uh, uh, anybody who's sane and and has any sort of study in Christian theology should agree with him on that. He's implying that. And the, the answer is that's why we disagree. It goes farther back. There are deeper issues here than the creation of gods or the existence of gods or what is a God is it a title. Is it a person? What is God? The, 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 the Trinitarian doctrine, it goes deeper, but he's, he's not going to address any of that. He's going to poke at this, idea that there's no other gods and then he's going to quote heiser well, we can watch it but he's going to quote heiser saying that he's a trinitarian which he is i don't think you ever said he yeah wasn't. we we know i said he wasn't i said in my video explicitly that heiser's not mormon guys like mm -hmm. this guy isn't but but the whole point was to show that heiser is refuting the commonly held christian assumption the that that verse. that that verse means that there exists no other gods and the the uh but again it gets into this thing of how what do you define as god right and we utilize different definitions this is one of the things that again when you don't take the time to actually understand your opponent you just go in and start ranting you're not understanding that when we say god we're not talking about the same sort of thing that you are you're talking about a spaceless timeless immaterial passionless um entity that creates out of nothing right like when we talk about that is is made out of nothing and created from nothing yes and we we can mean different things when we say god we can refer to god the father we can we, when we use the word god we might refer to the godhead we uh we might be referring to divinity itself divinity as a title right to be divine so there's a lot of actual nuance and interesting conversation to have here but He's not interested in that conversation. He's just no. taking his his particular interpretation of a particular type of Mormon sort of view uh, and then trying to crap all over it. Well, one thing that I notice is you don't even you're not even giving an argument yet. And he's refuting unless and maybe maybe he watched the video, but he's not showing the audience what you're actually saying about this. He let you talk for 10 seconds and you said, hold on, Jeff, let's let's let Michael Heiser. And then he paused it. Didn't show any Michael Heiser. And now he's going on this rant and using some big words to impress his audience. Like it's not, I don't understand. Maybe, maybe he's just not good at organizing his thoughts or this is live. I guess this is not, you know, they didn't edit this as far as I know. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe he's not good on his feet. Let's uh, let's go ahead and continue and finish out this clip real quick. We got about a minute left of it. What kind of God is he talking about? A true God, the living God, the eternal God, the creator God, the only God. So you're abusing the text, you're abusing Heiser, you have no response, you cannot, you cannot engage with Isaiah 43.10, nor can you engage with Isaiah 44.6. I am the first and I am the last, besides me there is no God. He's not talking about other heavenly beings there. He's... See how he's conflating? Yep, 100%. Heavenly beings. But as we already watched and the audience saw it, what is the word that's used? Is it Elohim? It's Elohim. It's the mm -hmm. same title that's used for God. So you can, he, he wants to create these, and, and the translations that are given are, are that. And when Jesus 
is confronted and he Jesus quotes Psalm 82. That's the reason it's so important here. When he says to them, when they're like, oh, we're going to stone you because you think you're God. And he says, didn't you know that you all are gods? You know, you're Elohim as well. Like he's, this stuff can be shown. Um, and he acts like I'm not engaging with the verses. The problem is, is that all the things that Heiser talks about, that is what engages with the verses. It shows that his interpretation or the common interpretation that there are no other gods out there, that there, uh, you know, there's no other Elohim to use the exact word is false. Now he'll say, oh, well, this is what he does. He says, well, Elohim doesn't mean gods, even though the word Elohim is used to say God, he's trying to conflate this that, well, we would agree that, yes, there is no other highest, most high God. Like, we agree with that. Like, we're on the same page. What we're saying, though, is that there is no other, um, but to say that there is no one else that's in the category of a divine being, of divinity, is wrong. That's just yep. not the case. And I think later, later in the video, he brings up the King Fala discourse, and he talks about, you know, our conception of the nature of God. And he, he uses that to basically say, because you don't agree with our concept of God, you guys are wrong, which I said in our last segment, like it's a common Protestant apologetic tool to say, because you don't agree with my worldview, you are wrong without substantiating why my worldview is wrong other than that. It disagrees with yours. That's what's happening here. Yeah. Um, do you want to go to the next clip or do you want to finish? There's like 20 seconds left on this one. Um, yeah, we might as well finish it. Get, do do okay. him uh, justice. Okay. He's talking about he's the first and the last. There is no other God. Now, Jacob, be honest. Have integrity here, my friends. You don't believe either of those things. You don't believe God's the first God. You don't believe God's the last God. Period. You don't believe that. And Isaiah 44, 8, he doesn't even know of any other God besides him? Well, wait a second. If he's talking about heavenly beings there, which is Heiser's context, then he would know of other heavenly beings. That's clear throughout scripture. He knows who the heavenly beings are. He created them. So he's not talking about heavenly beings there or supernatural beings there. He's talking about he doesn't know of any other God. He's the only God. So again, this waving of the hand of the text isn't helpful. And simply saying, you know, Scripture speaks in idioms at times. Yeah, it does. But the whole Bible is not an idiom. <laughs> it's not all idioms. Okay, a couple comments on that. Did you did you hear the ad hominem attack? You know, if, be, yeah. if you were honest, if you had integrity, it's like, okay, those are jabs to to discredit you by your character rather than actually confront what you're saying and the other thing is again he's conflating right he's saying there is no other gods well jeff i think you would agree there are other gods you know and, and there are other little, he says it but then he changes it around he says there are other heavenly beings mm -hmm. well fine we start getting into these weird distinctions where if jeff wants to say there's only one most high god i would say yeah i agree like i agree with that and maybe you and I have a little bit of a difference of opinion on some of the details in that. But well, but the reality yeah. is, is that there is one unique most high God, but there are other people that can arise to the status of an Elohim, of a heavenly being, of, of someone that is divine, right? We can enter into the divine nature and the divine life. Yeah. And I would even argue that we are there already. Like we, we are, or our origin is divine. We are, we are gods in embryo, right? As it's been said before. So, but to reach that full stature, to, to fully realize the nature uh, that is already inside of us. One other thing that I wanted to just make sure everyone was aware of. Um, oh, let's see. I just lost my train of thought. Oh, he, he assumed, he assumed what you believe. And I don't know, we, we don't need to, people can go watch your conversation and our conversation with Blake Osler on, what is it called? Monarchical, monarchical monotheism? Mon monarchical monotheism. Monarchical so monotheism. The idea of, or it, mm -hmm. it also can be called henotheism. Mm -hmm. uh, henotheism is the idea that there are more, there are other gods that exist, but there is a most high God that you worship. Right. Yep. And I don't think he understands that. I don't know if he studied any of that. And I think that was that a, a term coined by Blake Osler. I can't remember who 
the uh, first I'm not, person to I'm say not that. sure. I know, I know henotheism is a very common one. And if I were to describe the Old Testament uh, and the way that it views the mm. world, and I think Michael Heiser would agree, it's a henotheistic worldview. It's a view that says there are other divine beings or other gods out there, but that there is one that stands above as the one to be worshipped. You know, as a Latter-day Saint watching Michael Heiser, even though he doesn't... Okay, let's just be fair. You know, there are many Latter-day Saints, and we're not held to this in, in our in our membership interviews, in our in our ecclesiastical interviews, our temple recommended interviews, that God was, was once a man. I don't think... And, and Latter-day Saints are not required to believe that. A lot of them do, including myself. But even though Michael Heiser didn't, doesn't agree with that, even if he is a Trinitarian, even if he does believe in creation next to Hill, even if he does believe that God is spaceless, timeless, and matterless, listening to Michael Heiser as a Latter-day Saint, it, it's really, uh, it's eye-opening for us because in our worldview, it, it aligns perfectly. Now, that's not to say that there's no, no disagreements whatsoever on anything Michael Heiser ever said or how he interprets it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we. Di- I'm sure we disagree in all sorts of ways yep. with Michael Heiser, as he is a mm-hmm. Trinitarian. However, we agree that the Old Testament is henotheistic. Yep. That's right. the only point we're making here. And yeah. and 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 he, is- he he he's trying to make you out to say that you're trying to say Michael Heiser agrees with us on everything. This is a score for Latter Day Saints, and it's like it's not a- really. Yeah, it's a it's it's stupid. It's it's honest. It's like it's like him quoting atheist scientist that says something that implies creation and then being like and then his interlocutor would be like, oh, well. As an atheist, are you trying to make it out that the atheist agrees with you because that atheist doesn't believe in God? It's like you guys, you can have people. It's called the genetic fallacy. It's where you reject an argument based on where it's from. And what he's trying to do is trying to say, like, you can't endorse Heiser's one point unless you embrace all of Heiser. Right. And I'm like, no, just that's false. not what I'm doing. I yeah. just am, I'm acknowledging what any good biblical scholar will realize is that the, the old Testament is actually not strictly monotheistic. It's not. And that, that is something that traditional Christians like him in his video imply, well, he knows better, but in his video, they make this out like Mormonism's crazy, man. They believe that there exists other gods. I'm like, so yeah. do you. <laughs> so do you. so does anyone who believes in the Bible. They just believe that there we like the Old Testament. We are, I think it's fair to consider us henotheists. We believe in the existence of other gods, but we believe that there is one God who acts as the most high God that we worship. Which is it's like, wait it's a minute. Same. We're aligned with the Old Testament. People who are strict monotheists actually are out of line with what the Old Testament teaches. That was my point. And so he doesn't, but he doesn't do that. He just kind of goes, well, it's uh, there are no other gods because in order to be a god, you have to fit the criteria of the prime mover, essentially, which is, again, like you were saying, it's presupposing their worldview. Yeah. And the text of the Bible doesn't support that. It's an invention of Greek philosophy. And, you know, so let, let's be fair to Jeff. I think for his audience, who probably are mo- most of them are probably Protestants, they share this worldview. So when he hounds on you or Mormonism, it it, it rings true to them. It, it gets to them to say, oh, it, it's it's a tool. It, it's an echo chamber of, well, here's why they're wrong, because they disagree with our worldview. But it's like he's not actually engaging with you, the person who it really matters, who he engages with. It's yeah. like that's why we need to have these conversations face to face, which he's unwilling to do. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. The next one is actually pretty similar. Um, let's watch it. It's four minutes long. Number two, heavenly beings are not gods. Yeah, and uh, and, at, and if you want to if you want to stop or if you feel like we're getting, I mean, because well, we are hitting on some of the same points, we can do that. But let's watch it for a few minutes because obviously it, it has he has more to say. Okay. Um, let's see how far we want to take it. Okay. It came with a revelation. All right, so uh, explaining all of that, because this is just pulled from Heiser from one of his videos, and you have to ask the question, what is Heiser getting at? What is he aiming at? And here is the context. By the way, I have said for a long time, and I've always been friendly towards Heiser, but just said there's things that concern me, and what concerned me was that Heiser was very sloppy. Uh, He was very sloppy in how he explained this, 
and sloppy in such a way is that people could misunderstand what he was actually trying to aim at. Now, I want to say what Heiser actually demonstrated at times in his in his work was not a novelty. Um, it wasn't even altogether impressive. It was things that I learned in 1996 when I entered into Bible college and studied angelology and demonology. My first class there in, in theology when we were doing that, we learned about all of this in terms of the language. And this is the key issue. Everyone follow me here. Don't get distracted or, or don't get uh, mixed up here. This is, this is, this is the issue. In the Hebrew word, language, there is a word for God, Elohim, and Elohim is used also f to describe gods, uh, gods in the English language. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean in Hebrew? The issue is it could mean it could be referring to the only God, the true God, or it can be referring to heavenly beings. So Heiser was pointing out that actually we got to be careful here because the English language doesn't really help us. That was his main point. When you see an English translation of the word Elohim and it says God, we have to actually dig deeper to say, what does it actually mean? Are we saying there's no other heavenly beings, which is what Heiser says Elohim is when it's referring there to in the text of the Hebrew, heavenly beings, supernatural creatures. That's Heiser's point. Here's the problem. English language, the word God is used with the true God and it's used of heavenly beings, God, gods, those sorts of things. Now, here's the point. Okay. Jacob misrepresents Heiser here, trying somehow to say, well, like even Heiser recognizes that there's other gods besides the true God. And hey, we're Mormon. We believe that, that as man once was God, uh, uh, as, as man as God once was, as God is, man may become. You know, that's our whole belief is that, you know, there's a plurality of gods. There were gods before Elohim of this earth and gods before them. And you can become a God one, year, one, one day yourself. Okay, pause, and that's, pause for a second, that's eternal life to know the only. So, so again, he's conflating the word God. What, what is a God? What does uh, Isaiah 44, 3 or 13 or whatever it is, what, is, what does Isaiah mean when he says gods? What, what do Latter-day Saints mean? And what's, is there even an official stance of the church? When well, it comes he, to he, he presupposes when he comes to this discussion that the God of the Bible is this spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uh, passionless yep. force as I so He's far saying as I there's tell. no other God like that. And it's like, yeah, in your worldview, sure. Yeah, but the, the, we well, have to, but that's exactly he's imposing his particular view on the text. The text mm -hmm. does not describe God in that way. No, in fact, the text contradicts that sort of a conception of God. And historically, any biblical scholar who knows what the heck they're talking about will recognize that the God of the Old Testament is a God who is a God amongst gods, but that is considered the most high God. Again, this is perfectly in line with what Latter-day Saints believe. And again, when we talk about God, it, we can vary in what we mean by it. It can, again, it can refer to a divine being, uh, someone, someone who has reached a status of, of, of divinity, as we would call it, godhood, or it can also refer to God the Father, like a particular most high God, right? And so I, I think, and let, me, let me share something real quick. Directly from our institute manual from the church, um, I want to show you guys what it says here. Now, this is on the church's website. And it talks about this. It says, by definition, and this is, uh, this is quoting Bruce R. McConkie, but don't worry, it's still in the church's manual. Not everything Bruce R. McConkie said was wrong. <laughs> in fact, quite a lot of what he said was right. And this, I think, is right. It says, by definition, God, generally meaning the Father, is the one supreme and absolute being, the ultimate source of the universe, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, creator, ruler, and preserver of all things. In Joseph Smith's lecture on faith, number 10, he says, God is the only supreme governor and independent being in whom all fullness uh, and perfection dwell, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, uh, without beginning of days or end of life, <clears throat> and that in him every good gift and every good principle dwell, and that it, uh, and he is the father of lights, and in him the principle of faith dwells independently, and he is the object in whom the faith of all other of all other rational and accountable beings center for life and salvation. So again, the theme here that you're seeing, 
within our own theology is that we do hold that there exists a being that can properly be understood as the most high. What we also contend is that there are other beings like us that Jesus looked at and said, ye are gods. And what he meant by that is you too can join into the nature and oneness that I and the Father share, right? So again, you're creating this uh, this structure of father and children and children who can become like the father, but they never will surpass their father. Father is always the father. And so this doesn't, again, it, it, he wants to say, oh, it's heavenly beings. Well, fine. Use whatever word you want. We're describing the same thing. Uh, well, at least we aren't describing the same characteristics of what entails uh, the father, but we are mm -hmm. describing a landscape that where there is a most high entity and then there are those who are below who uh, can become divine beings uh, that share in the attributes of Godhood and oneness with him, as Jesus said in John 17. So I think there are, let me say it like this. We agree at a certain level, but at a step below of the nature of God is ultimately where we disagree. What is the origin of God, right? Yeah, what are um, his attributes? But the mm -hmm. landscape is the same. Mm -hmm. So I think where the debate really is, is, is the triune God, the most high God? That's the question. So Jeff, if you're watching this, here's an open uh, invitation to uh, debate, whether it be me or Jacob or both of us or uh, anybody who you would like to bring in, in on this with you. That is the question. Does the Bible teach the triune God? It obviously doesn't. Um, and I hope you'd be willing to uh, at least try to refute that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, I think we've hit on this distinction between heavenly beings and, you know, gods. I don't think yeah, we need to hash into that. I let's do the third one, the theosis. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the theosis one. So I'm going to go ahead and get that prepped up. Do you want to give any, uh, yeah. any sort of background on it or? Um, I think just keep watching for ad hominem attacks. Keep watching for how much screen time Jeff gives, uh, Jacob and, uh, see the straw man in it. Um, that's basically what all these videos are. Let's see it. Okay. And he would absolutely reject yeah. that. King Follett discourse, he said this, we've imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will take away that idea and take away that do away the veil so that you may see. He says, you've got to learn to become gods yourselves the same way all gods have done before you. This goes against everything the Bible says about who God is. Really? The idea of us becoming as God is, also known as theosis, goes against... Oh. 10 seconds of you. That was another example of what seems to be the typical Mormon apologist methodology is to use terminology and historical words and context to confuse an audience that has never heard of them before and doesn't even understand. You just tried to compare the Mormon view of becoming a God one day, because that was a quotation from the King Fallout discourse where Joseph specifically says that that revelation was given to him by vision in the Holy Spirit. And that if you saw God today, you seem like yourself and a man and all the form of a man. And he says, what? He says, you've got to learn to become gods yourselves the same way all gods have done before you here. That is eternal life. There's no only one true and only wise and true God. He perverts the text of Jesus and says, and to become gods yourselves the same way all gods have done before you. And you're like, hey, no, this is not strange. I mean, this is historically what we know as theosis. And every Eastern Orthodox person is going, what? What? Every Roman Catholic theologian's going, uh, excuse me? And every He didn't even let you say anything about it. <laughs> well, he's he's mad that I'm using the term theosis. What's mm -hmm. funny is is and then he's saying like what you you guys think that your idea of this is theosis just like what the Catholics and the Orthodox teach. It's like, oh, no. No. Obviously not. Like quit straw manning, dude. Like obviously our notion of theosis is different from others. However, what is the the general concept of theosis? Just look at the meaning of the word. Let me pull up something real quick. I want to pull up from the Oxford, uh, uh, I believe it's a biblical reference guide um, that talks about theosis. 
Um, let me just share this real quick, this tab. Um, and it says here, right here, DF, uh, quick reference, theosis or deification in the Byzantine tradition is the goal of man to which he is naturally destined and which is realized through the grace of God. Okay, so it's talking about deification. So what's deification? Let's share that. To deify something is to make it a god. <laughs> okay? Theosis. If I come over here to just, you know, random, uh, like, dictionary, there's a place called Wordnik online, and it says, um, I'll share that tab. It says, the fact of becoming a god, deification. So as a general concept in Christian thought, it, now, they, they don't believe, like, there are distinctions in the way that we view this for sure, but those distinctions are not as big as a lot of people might realize. Um, let me go for example. Um, we will go and look at what some of the actual uh, Orthodox say on this matter. Let's pull this up. It says here, uh, this is from the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. And it says, I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. And that's quoting Psalm 82, 6. And it says, this is a verse that most Protestants do not underline in their Bibles. <laughs> I love what, the sarcasm there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what on earth does it mean, you are gods? Doesn't our faith teach that there is only one God in three persons? How can human beings be gods? In the Orthodox Church, this concept is neither new nor startling. It even has a name, theosis. Theosis is the understanding that human beings can have a real union with God and so become like God to such a degree that we participate in the divine nature. God is God because of his nature. And you to some, now there are distinctions, but some of these distinctions aren't as big as you might think. And in fact, within the Latter-day Saint tradition, we have internal discussions about what does it mean to become God. And many Latter-day Saints hold a position that is really not that different from what you just read, okay? Or basically the exact same, that there's a level to which we can become as God is and, and share in the divine nature, okay? so. He's making it out like there's this giant chasm, and there does exist differences. I I'm, I never claimed. He's making the straw man that I'm claiming it's the exact same thing. It's not. But any Latter-day Saint who just read that would be like, that sounds a lot like what I've been taught. Okay? So he's just BSing. Well, he's not even letting you talk. Like, you, I don't think you make the argument, correct me if I'm wrong, that our theosis in your video, I mean, you don't make the argument that our theosis or our conception of that or deification or becoming like God is identical. You've never even made that that no, connection at I all. Said, I just said it's a general, the general notion of theosis, of deification mm -hmm. is not it's something not, totally you, foreign to the Christian tradition. No. So, so we why have ours is different, but it's not that far different. No. So I don't understand why, why he's doing this. I mean, it's content for him. I don't know why he's not actually engaging with what you're saying, because maybe it's difficult to refute. I think he'd have to agree with you, but, yeah. but yet he doesn't. And he goes on for 25 minutes about how you're wrong. It's like, we're not even saying that Jeff, come on. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. So I'm going to go back here to his video. Let's let him continue. Every Protestants going, uh, have you read the discussion on theosis? I mean, I it might, we maybe it did. would be valuable. Maybe we should do this. We'll get a local Eastern Orthodox leader to come in here and say funny hat and all everything we'll say here's the king fall at discourse <laughs> and jacob's a mormon apologist and he said that what you believe in theosis is what joseph is saying there comment please okay guys Anyone, does anyone know what a straw man argument is? Anyone ever heard of heard of that term? Uh, because you just witnessed what is a straw man argument. I never, I never made that claim. And he's like, oh, that'd be so funny. Like, dude, this isn't serious. Like, you're not, you're not actually engaging. In why is he, here. why is he not engaging though? Like he has a 400,000 follower audience. Like he why is he not engaging? divinity things? He's a pastor. I mean, this guy, like this is what he does for a living. Like, and you can't even engage like in a yeah, serious way. 
I don't get it. I don't know. I, I wish he would just talk with us, but he uh, demonizes us too much to be willing to talk. It would be a very interesting episode. No, theosis is not what jo Joseph Smith was saying or teaching or believing. And anybody who knows the conversation of theosis would never make such a claim. And honestly, Jacob, I mean this with as much due respect to you as possible. You should be embarrassed for the comparison. If you all want to see a discussion of a Mormon apologist doing the same thing as Jacob here and just getting refuted completely, I highly encourage you to look up on YouTube, look, in a, look up um, Martin Tanner versus James White, Can Men Become Gods, and watch Tanner, the Mormon apologist, get absolutely refuted through his abuse of history, taking quotations from early church fathers, talking about how as Christians and regeneration and new life and being raised a spiritual life, being made new creations, how we are actually, we participate in the divine nature. The conversation for them in the East. We participate in the divine nature. God is God because of his nature. If you participate in that nature, I, I like, fine, we, there, the devil's in the details. I'm sure there's distinctions that can be made. But to act like these are just, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that you would ever claim that this has anything to do with theosis. It's like, this is very, very similar. Now, d he wants to go off on his, well, Mormons believe that you get a planet and it's like this. And, th and he has this super narrow, like fundamentalist, hardcore sort of straw man that he imposes that this is what all Latter-day Saints believe. When in essence, a lot of the nature of these and the details on some of this, even Latter-day Saints disagree about. Christians disagree about the level of theosis with one another. Latter-day Saints disagree about what theosis looks like with one another. This is just, it's just silly. Yeah, I, I don't understand why the lack of engagement here. And I, I'm i going to assume he's genuine. I'm going to to extend that grace and say, let's just have a conversation about it to, to talk about it. Because really, Jeff, if you're watching this, um, you're not spreading true information about what we're talking about. Like you are, sh you are shedding false information. Um, and if you, I hope you come to realize that. And I hope at the end of this video, it's kind of funny. He, you probably watched the whole thing. He invites you to take your video down. Did you see that? <laughs> He's like, if you're honest, you will remove this video. And it's like, I maybe he really wants me to remove that video. Maybe, maybe well, there's a reason that he wants me to remove absolutely. it. Absolutely. I think, <laughs> you know, so anyway, Jeff, maybe you'll remove this video when you realize how many false things you're saying. <laughs> how much how much time do we have left on this? We have, uh, we have two minutes. We have about a minute and a half left. Do you okay, want to continue? Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's just give them the, the everything to do with our participation in the divine nature and new birth and regeneration or new life in Jesus Christ. It did have nothing, nothing, nothing to do whatsoever with becoming a God one day, like Joseph Smith said there in the King Fallout discourse. And anybody that says so demonstrates. And I, I challenge you, I challenge you on this, Jacob. Have you ever read? Notice he the never challenges you to debate. teachings and studies that the fathers did on theosis. And I don't mean quote mine. I don't mean seeing a quote from a Mormon apologetics article where you see a quote and, hey, that looks like what we're saying. Right. I mean, have you actually read them in their discussions to say, what, what actually were they, were they talking about? Because I don't believe that any man of integrity at all could actually have read the discussions on theosis and come to the conclusion that you just did because that wasn't their worldview. That wasn't their context. You just took a word theosis that means something very specific to historic Christianity and tried to compare it to what Joseph Smith said in the King Follett discourse. And I want to say to you, shame on you. And it demonstrates abject Jacob. ignorance of church. Did, did, yeah. you mention, did you mention King Follett discourse? <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's I didn't at all. And that's see, this is the thing. He he creates this this terrible argument and says, This is what Jacob thinks, and then he kicks it over and then declares victory and says, You need to take down your video. You're not a man of integrity. A a person of integrity doesn't straw man their opponents. Okay. And it's pretty, pretty bad the straw manning in both the videos that he did. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the takeaway when I watched these in full, I was actually excited that, that Jeff Durbin was making a response because Jeff is a sharp guy and, and, and he's a, he's a worthy opponent. I don't, a, a debate with Jeff would not be a cakewalk. It would be one that I'd have to be very prepared for. However, to watch him, someone who I actually think has a fairly high caliber of intellect, just miss the ball, just like 
I like it when someone provides a solid critique, but when you just get out there and straw man the whole time, I mean, it's kind of disappointing, honestly. Yeah, I was, I was hoping we would actually be able to engage, but most of these videos are us just saying, that's not what we believe. Like, yep. And and is, isn't that the classic thing with Protestant uh, uh, oh, critiques? Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. they, they attack a version of Mormonism that you don't believe. They say the common thing amongst Protestants when they will encounter you, and all of us kind of know this, they'll tell you what you believe, and then they'll say why it's wrong. That's very common. But it's like, wait a minute, hold on here. Why don't you ask me what I believe? Like, let me explain it. But it's like, you that know what's funny though? Go ahead. In all of my hundreds, hundreds of hours of communicating with Protestants, and I won't give any names just for privacy's sake, almost never am I asked what I believe. Almost never. Maybe yeah. one time I can think, and it was like one question, and he was kind of just like, okay. It's, like, what it's, do you think about it? Here's the tactic. Never. You pull out a Brigham Young quote or a Bruce R. McConkie quote or some quote that is either wrong or or half truth or whatever. They pull that out and they say, this is what you believe. This is what your leaders say. You have to endorse this. And it's like, that's just, <laughs> that isn't good faith. You, you ask someone what they believe, and then you once you understand and have steel man their position, then you can begin to offer a critique of it. But if you don't understand what the person across from you actually believes, and you're telling them what they believe, then it's like... Yeah, my, my most interaction with Apology of Church, because they often go here in Mesa, Arizona, go around to different church buildings every other week. If they're on, still on the same schedule, that's how I met them, as they showed up at my ward building. Um, my In my hours of conversation with those people on the streets... Really nice people, by the way. I've come to realize that, and I, I, I guess I, I'm commenting on your on your comment about in good faith. I think a lot of them just don't know how to have the conversation any other way. Like that's how they are taught. They literally have a class about approaching Mormons on the street and doing street epistemology, and that is the tactics that they are taught. So I, I almost don't even blame them. Um, I, I don't know if anyone here has ever listened to. Uh, a sermon. It's on Apology of Studios YouTube. I think it's called. Uh, they post their uh, most of the time, or maybe every time they post their weekly Sunday sermons, whether it be by mostly by Jeff and James White. And I can't tell you how many times they're preaching about something in the Bible, and then they dig at Mormonism, and it's like, why? What does Mormonism have to do at all with what you're talking about in Acts chapter four? Like you're talking about the apostles or Jesus Christ. And then you put in a line about Mormonism and what it does is it drives, like you said, a chasm between the saints or the uh, people of apology of church against the latter day saints. And I've seen that like what they are being taught in their churches of Mormonism. Um, you almost can't hold them accountable because it's like, okay, like they're believing what they're being taught essentially. So anyway, I don't, I don't want to throw any, any, Protestant under the bus who doesn't really understand what we believe, maybe if they're not of their own fault. That's kind of what I'm yeah. trying to say. And there's, and honestly, that's why I appreciate people like Jeff McCullough and uh, Steve Pinecker and some of these others who do actually do that. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a certain brand of Protestantism that is very much the Jeff Durbin, James White flavor, but there are others. And I, and I appreciate those Protestants who do take the time to, to actually listen to what we have to say. And yes, we have disagreements. Like we don't have to, you don't have to create straw men. Like we actually disagree. So let's focus on that and not, you know, focus on these areas that are just, I don't know. It just, and then all the, all the, you're a man of evil integrity and you need to take this. It's like, okay, it, it, yeah. it gets pretty absurd and it becomes kind of a, a show, I think. So any yeah. other thoughts uh, before we wrap this up? Nope. I think it's good. I think people should go watch the video in its entirety. Watch your video and watch Jeff's video to get the full context for sure. Perfect. And Jeff, please uh, reach on out to us. I'll leave my email in the video description. You can reach out and we can set up something. I'd love to do a debate on the Trinity or some of these issues that we've talked about. Um, it'd be really great. So anyway, thanks everybody for watching and we'll catch you around. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints. 
where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.